Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll give it um, about 12 more minutes and then we'll get started.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to give it a few more minutes and then we'll get started at six o'clock. Thanks.
All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's virtual version of Oxbow After Dark. Um, my name is Jessica Height, and I am uh, a wildlife educator with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Tonight, I am joined by Scout and Amanda, who are AmeriCorps educators uh, that work with the Department of Wildlife as well. So they will be helping me out tonight to respond to any questions that you might have throughout the program. So first, we just have a couple of housekeeping items. So if you have any um, questions or comments, uh, please direct them to the Q&A box. So for this program tonight, uh, the chat is turned off. So please direct uh, any questions and comments to the Q&A box. And you can do that at any point during the, the program and Amanda will be responding to your questions. Tonight's program is um, a One Truckee River Month event. So uh, there is an organization, a local nonprofit profit called One Truckee River, and the entire month of May is all about celebrating the Truckee River. So they have events all month long, and this entire month has gone virtual for this year. So you can go to onetruckeeriver.org slash events to see what else they have coming up uh, throughout the rest of the month. So we are doing another program next Wednesday that's going to be a birding program that's one Truckee River month and um, we will also be doing another uh, Oxbow After Dark at the end of the month if you have any friends that might have missed this one. So head to onetruckeeriver.org slash events to find out what other programs that they have going on. And lastly, this is a uh, family friendly program. So please keep all uh, questions and comments on topic and appropriate in the Q&A boxes. Thanks. So first, um, I actually have a question for you. So we are going to be launching a poll as I am curious um, how many people tuning in tonight have actually been to Oxbow. So a poll should be popping up on your screens. And I'll give you a few moments to answer it. Uh, uh, how many of you have been to Oxbow? Oh, awesome. Wonderful. OK, let's go ahead and share our results with everybody. Um, so looks like lots of you have been to Oxbow, about 60%. That makes me super excited. Um, but I am also so excited to have people that have never been to Oxbow. Uh, so that is fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us without even knowing what Oxbow is. So first, uh, I'll give you a little introduction. Um, so Oxbow is in Reno, and it is a 22-acre nature study area. So this is a completely wild-growing riparian park um, full of cottonwoods and um, willows and all kinds of beautiful native plants, really lush, uh, nice and shady there. Um, it's located right on the Truckee River, and it's only about a mile and a half west of downtown Reno. Uh, so this is really, truly an oasis in the middle of the city. So in this bottom left photo, that is our visitor center, uh, which is currently closed. Um, but throughout the year, we do all kinds of education um, with different groups of people. So we bus in thousands of students each year, and we have field trips at the park. We also do community events, such as Oxbow After Dark, um, that we host throughout the summer. And then uh, Oxbow is also a partnership between the city of Reno and the Department of Wildlife. So the city of Reno manages the park Park, and we do all of the programming and the staffing out there. Uh, so you can go visit anytime um, and go check out the, the beautiful park. There is um, about a mile's worth of trails throughout the park. So how do you find Oxbow? Um, is, it is located at 3100 Dickerson Road. Uh, so 2nd Street um, turns into Dickerson Road and it actually dead ends into the park. So once you get down to the end of the street, you'll find a little driveway that slopes down and you go down that driveway and it dead ends right into the parking lot of Oxbow. And that's where you'll find the visitor center. Uh, so 3100 Dickerson Road and I put up our hours up there as well. Uh, so Oxbow After Dark is really a, a pretty special program because uh, we do have to lock the gate at night. Um, so for the most part, you don't get to be in there after dark. So that's why Oxbow After Dark is so fun, is that we get to be in the park after hours and get to see some really fun critters. 
We have a huge diversity of animals at Oxbow. Um, these are just a few photos, uh, and I apologize for them being mediocre photos as I did snap these myself, some of which uh, were with a cell phone. Um, but we have all kinds of fascinating animals at Oxbow. Uh, so definitely come uh, once the world is back open again, come out to Oxbow and see for yourself. So tonight's program is all about the nocturnal critters of um, nocturnal critters of oxbow. So what exactly is it that makes an animal nocturnal? So the definition of a nocturnal animal means that they are active at night um, and asleep during the day. And many nocturnal animals have specialized characteristics that allow them to be successful at night or help them to, to find their way in the dark. So these are all different kinds of adaptations. So adaptations um, are either body parts that an animal has or a behavior that it does that allows it to be more successful um, to survive in their habitat. So some of these specialized characteristics um, are like their eyesight. So uh, in order to see in the dark, uh, nocturnal animals have specialized eyesight. So one of the things that a lot of them have are really large eyes. Uh, so this animal here in the photo is a green tail. And you can see that the eyes are like the majority of its face. <laughs> um, so they have really large eyes and also really large pupils. So their pupils can get a lot bigger than a human's pupil to allow uh, more light to come in. They will also have extra rods. So lights have, or eyes have rods and they also have cones. And rods are what uh, senses dim light. And so having extra rods allows them to see better in dim or dark light. But because they have those extra rods, it means that they sacrifice some of their cones. And cones are what allow us to uh, see color. So for the most part, um, nocturnal animals do not have a very good color vision because they can see in the dark instead. They also have something called a topatum, which you have probably seen before. Uh, so if you've ever been driving down a road at night and your headlights hit an animal in the trees and you see the, the flash in their eyes or even using a flashlight, maybe a, a dog or a cat that, that you have at your house and you caught the light and you see that, uh, that flash in their eyes, that is um, the topatum. So it's like a little mirror that they have on the inside of their eyes that reflects light back onto the retina um, to allow them to see better. So whenever you see that flash of light in an animal's eyes, you're actually seeing the reflection of the light in their eyes. So they have that extra tapetum to allow for extra light sensing. They might also have specialized hearing. So something that's pretty common is cupped ears. So the ringtail, again, in that photo is a pretty good example of cupped ears. So they're rounded uh, to allow them to hear better. So this is something that you can actually try out if you're willing to, to work with me. So you can take your little hands and cup them like this and put them around your ears. And as I talk, you can hear that it is a lot clearer uh, and a little bit louder. And that's why animals have those cupped ears is for, for better, better hearing. And they can also move them around. Um, so mountain lions is another animal that has these cupped ears and they are highly mobile. So they can turn them different directions and have really good hearing um, and find out where these different sounds are coming from. Another type of specialized hearing that animals have is um, offset ears. So you would find this in owls. And that means that one ear is actually higher on the head than the other one on the side of their head. And this allows them to really key in on where their prey is. So when owls are hunting, they're actually listening for their food more so than looking for it. And so having this offset hearing, uh, these offset ears allows them to sense where that, that sound is coming from better so that they can really key in in on their prey. Uh, a really specialized uh, type of hearing is echolocation that's present in bats. Uh, so they can send out noises into the night because they're not using their sight almost at all. Uh, so we'll send out noises into the night and wait for them to bounce off of things and wait and listen for that echo to come back. And that is how they are seeing and navigating through the darkness. Animals might also have really specialized senses of smell. Uh, so lots of animals use scent marking uh, to mark their territories. And they have something called a Jacobson's organ, which uh, is an extra organ that senses chemoreceptors. 
And so they will, if they find a, a certain smell, they'll kind of make a funny face, they'll grimace and bare their teeth a little bit. And that is to activate the Jacobson organ, which is just above um, the interior of their mouth, but it's part of their, their sense of smell um, that allows them to have a really excellent sense of smell. So they'll make kind of a funny face to be able to activate the Jacobson's organ a little bit better. And a lot of animals kind of have one or maybe two of these super specialized adaptations. Um, you don't typically get to have all of them. So if you have really excellent eyesight, you might have pretty mediocre hearing and sense of smell. So uh, animals tend to have one or maybe two if they're really lucky that are super highly developed. So what are some of the advantages of being nocturnal? So one of the big ones is resource competition. Um, so a good example of this would be hawks and owls. So they're both eating small rodents um, and otherwise they would be competing with each other for the same source of food. But since hawks tend to be active during the day, which we call diurnal and owls are nocturnal hunting at night, they can hunt the same sources of food um, and not directly complete, compete with one another. So they get to fill a different niche Another one is predation. So uh, either to make predation better. So if you are a predator and you have um, prey that does not have very good night vision, that makes your uh, chances of capturing them a little bit easier because they don't have as good a night vision as you do. Um, or if you're an animal trying to avoid predation. Uh, so if, again, in the flip side of that, if a main predator of yours is active during the day and you come out at night to try to avoid them. An especially important one here in the desert is uh, to escape the heat of day. So in the desert, a lot of animals tend to be nocturnal, and that is so that they don't have to be out in the middle of the day when it's over 100 degrees, and that helps them to conserve water, which is uh, pretty scarce in the desert anyways. So they come out at night when it's cooler so that they're not um, expending as much energy and they are not burning off that really important water. And lastly, uh, to avoid humans, we come with a whole host of issues, including cars, pets, noise, we're smelly, we're scary, and there's all kinds of reasons to try to avoid us. So that is another reason that a lot of animals tend to be nocturnal or come out uh, when we go to sleep is so that they can avoid us. So the animals at Oxbow, we know we have a lot of wildlife, but we don't always get to see it. Um, for some of the reasons that we've been discussing, they might be nocturnal, so they might not be out when we're visiting Oxbow. They might be avoiding us, so they heard us coming and they want nothing to do with us, so they're hiding. They could have really good camouflage, or just that wildlife doesn't always cooperate and doesn't show up when I ask it to. <laughs> So one of the things we look out for at Oxbow is um, evidence of wildlife. So evidence uh, of wildlife is just things that animals left behind so that we know that they were there. So we might not get to see them, but we know that they were there because they leave their calling cards. So on the left is a woodpecker hole that's in one of our dead trees. And then in the middle, we've got some scat. So that is um, probably coyote scat, we believe, that was found in, in the middle of the trail. And another good thing to look out for is tracks. Um, Oxbow is really lush and typically wet, so that's really awesome because there's lots of mud for animals to leave tracks in. And so we've got some raccoon tracks here in the snow, and then this little burrow back here. Um, we have all kinds of animals coming in and out of this little burrow. We've seen quail and rabbits use it, and this day we knew a raccoon was using it as well. So look out for feathers that might be left behind, bird nests, or fur that got caught on a tree. Um, there's all kinds of evidence of wildlife to look out for at Oxbow. So let's get into some of the nocturnal critters that you can find at Oxbow. So one of the big ones that we catch on our trail cans all the time is going to be a raccoon. Uh, so raccoons are omnivores and they will eat literally anything. Um, it is one of the things that has allowed them to be super adaptable um, and go, live in a lot of different types of habitat is because their diet is very flexible. So what they really like to eat is um, like crustaceans. They tend to hunt near water a lot. Uh, so they'll be eating uh, crawdads or um, mussels, things like that. Um, they'll eat a lot of insects or carrion, which is dead, dead animals that they have found. Um, so they're not particularly good hunters, but they'll eat just about anything they can find, um, including fruits and vegetables and seeds. 
just about anything. And that means that they will also get into human sources of food and they'll get into our garbage sometimes, which has allowed them to be really successful living in the city. Some of the adaptations that uh, raccoons have that allow them to be really successful. So one of the big ones is these hands. So I specifically chose this photo so you could see the hands really well. So they have very human-like hands um, and their scientific name um, is actually procyon loader, which translates to dog-like washer. And that's because um, when they were first identified, people were observing them and it looks like raccoons wash their food. They um, they tend to stick near water. So anytime they find food, they'll dip their hands in their water and they'll rub it on the outside of their food. So it looks like they're washing it off. Um, but that's not actually what it's for. So they have really super sensitive hands and the water allows it to be even more sensitive. So they're actually getting a better sense of what they're eating by using their, their sense of touch, which is kind of unusual for animals. So they're using their sense of touch to figure out what of what they're holding is edible, what it is, um, and the water allows that to be even more sensitive. They are really excellent climbers, so to escape predators, um, they can climb up trees and their back feet can rotate 180 degrees, so they can go all the way backwards, um, which allows them to climb headfirst down a tree. So most animals that we see, you know, it goes up a tree and it comes back down the same way, much like humans would, but uh, raccoons can actually go down headfirst because they've got these feet that can turn around backwards and help them grip onto the tree a little bit better. And then they have that black mask to help them see better um, at night. So uh, it is there to, to reduce glare. So anytime when like football players um, put the black underneath their eyes, it's, it's the same sort of concept as they're trying to reduce glare. So here is some of the evidence of wildlife that we have um, found at Oxbow. So in on the right is some of their tracks. So I think they're some of the cutest tracks that you can find, but they're also super easily identifiable because they have the, that perfect little five fingered hand. Um, they have pretty obvious claws in there and then their back foot as well. Uh, I am pretty sure this particular raccoon was onto us and, and saw the trail cam, um, but we have a little waterway at Oxbow and that's where we get a lot of the, uh, the footage of the raccoons is they tend to stick to the water uh, for various sources of food. And then there's lots of mud down there so we can see lots, lots of tracks from the raccoon. I have another poll for everyone. So take a really good look at this photo and tell me how many raccoons you see. So look really hard. <laughs> All right, we'll give it just about five more seconds. All right, Scout, will you show us the results? <laughs> All right, so we do have majority of people, not by much, <laughs> but about 39% of people said that there are four raccoons and that is the right answer. So we have one raccoon here. Let me annotate so everyone can see. We have a raccoon here, here, three, and there's a little tail up here. This guy's jumping out of the frame, but there is four raccoons in this photo. So they are pretty social and they tend to hang out in family groups. Uh, so they do travel in, in groups. So we've got four in this photo. All right, on to our next critter. Uh, so this is always a super fun one that we hope we get to see. And the very first time we did an Oxbow After Dark, we got to see two of them, which was very exciting. Uh, so the North American beaver, we have a very active family of beavers at Oxbow. Um, and they are very strict herbivores. So they are eating the bark on the outside of trees. So in this photo on the right, you can see um, that the bark has been stripped off of, of the, the branches here. And that is because that's the part of the tree that's still growing and that's what they're actually eating. So they'll take down the whole tree, um, but they use the rest of the wood to build their dam and their lodge. So they're not necessarily eating all of, all of that wood. They're really just eating the outside of it. That is the part that has all of the good nutrition. 
And then they'll also eat, um, you know, new leaves and, and fresh growing twigs as well. Beavers have so many adaptations that allow them to, to survive in the water. Um, one of the main ones is that they have waterproof fur. So beavers have two layers of fur. So underneath they have a really fluffy fur um, layer that's kind of like down, really fluffy and soft. And that's to keep them warm. You know, these guys are living in the Truckee River, which is very cold water, and they do not hibernate. So they're active throughout the winter. So they definitely need to stay warm. So they've got that fluffy fur underneath and then they have these long spiny hairs on top and they produce oil that they then rub on their fur. So if you've ever seen oil and water uh, mix, they don't, they'll separate pretty good. And so that allows them to have like their own personal rain jacket on all of the time. So anytime they're in the water, the water basically just rolls right off of them. So from the, the combination of those long spiny hairs and the oil. And so that means that the fur underneath and their skin never even gets wet. And they also have super impressive teeth. So they are a member of the rodent family. So they're going to have those big orange teeth on the front. Um, and the orange is actually a special coating. So it's made of iron uh, that is there to keep their teeth really strong because they're chewing on wood all day long. So they need to be able to be really strong to be able to do that. So they have these teeth that get worn down pretty fast because they are chewing on wood all the time. So they are constantly growing and beaver teeth can actually grow up to four feet in one year. So they are growing all the time. And this is part of the reason that they have to chew on stuff. So like many rodents, they are gnawing on things all of the time. And that's because they need to be able to keep those teeth worn down because otherwise they can get too long and then they won't be able to eat. Um, but they can grow up to four feet in a year, which is crazy. To be really good swimmers, they have uh, webbed feet in the back that allow them to swim really well. They're, they're pretty fast. Um, and they also have, like you can see, they have those cupped ears. Um, but what's really neat about their ears is they can fold flat down against their head so that water doesn't get into their ears. I'm sure if you've ever had water in your ears, it's really super annoying and they would not want that all the time. So they fold flat against their head so that they, um, they don't get any water in there. And they, their super sense is really going to be their sense of smell. So as you can see in this picture of the, the beaver, um, it's got pretty small eyes, so not, not really strong um, eyesight and okay hearing, but they have a really good sense of smell so that they can smell predators. Uh, and then they can also smell their food and what's going to be the tastiest part of their food. And then, of course, they have that big flat tail on the back, which they use to um, try to scare off predators, let them know that they're getting too close when they slap it against the water, um, and also to warn other beavers in the group that there might be a predator nearby. So here is a couple of photos of um, some of the evidence of the beavers that we have out at the park. Uh, so the bottom left is going to be our pond. So this is the Oxbow Pond. Um, and it is totally maintained by the beavers. So there is a very large beaver dam um, that blocks off this pond and keeps it full uh, year round. And uh, on the right, so in between the pond and the river, so the pond is on one side of the park and the river is on the other side of the park. So in between those two, there is a little waterway that connects them. And throughout that little waterway, that little stream that runs through the park, um, the beaver has multiple dams, like four or five, five dams. Um, and this one on the right is one of the, the larger ones that's on the interior. So that's what they're doing with the rest of the wood. So they're using um, these, all of the logs that they, they, that they don't eat to be able to build the dam. And the dam is there to block the water to create the pond, to create their habitat. Because beavers are pretty clumsy on land. So they need this to be able to get around, stay safe and to raise their family. And then they also build the lodge. So the lodge is where the beavers actually live. So if you look really closely in this top left photo, there is a lodge, but it's kind of hidden behind the cattails. Um, so that's where the actual lodge is, is that bundle of sticks in the middle. And then there's a red winged blackbird um, hanging out on top there. And so the lodge is where the, the beavers actually live inside of. Um, and what's really neat about a beaver lodge is the entrance to it is underwater. Uh, and that's just, again, another way to protect themselves from predators. So they can swim into it, but then the rest of the lodge is above water. Last year, um, I haven't seen them around much this spring, but last year we actually had a pair of geese that nested on top of the beaver lodge and uh, raised their little goslings up there, which was super fun. 
Here are a couple of um, trail cam photos that we've gotten of the beaver. So you can get a really good look at that nice flat tail. Um, aquatic mammals, including like um, muskrats and otters, they're all very hard to tell apart when they're swimming because you, for the most part, really just see their little head poking up out of the water. So it's kind of hard. But if you ever get a good look at the tail, that's going to be the best identifying feature for the beaver. It was really exciting last year. Um, like I said, at the first Oxbow After Dark, we actually got to see two adults. And later we learned that we that those two adults are a breeding pair and that we have baby beavers in the park, or we did last year. Uh, so we caught on camera here a baby beaver. And I have a little video of when we were doing a Girl Scout program and uh, they got to see one of the baby beavers. So listen really closely um, towards the end. It's super cute. It's kind of like a beaver. It is a beaver, which is super exciting. So the, the Girl Scouts got to see a baby beaver. You can see that big flat tail here. Uh, so we do have a breeding pair. Um, we are not sure how many kits they have, but three to four is, is pretty common for beavers. Another animal that um, we see lots of sign from is the striped skunk. So they are also going to be omnivores and their diet's going to be very similar to that of a raccoon. Uh, they'll tend to eat more insects, but again, they'll eat just about anything, including human sources of food. Oftentimes they'll come onto people's back porches, get into cat food, anything that they can find. Um, they are, are not particularly picky. Uh, some of the amazing adaptations that they have is, uh, so this is the striped skunk. There are different species. We have two species in Nevada, so there's also a spotted skunk. But this one has these the big white stripes down the back. Um, and scientists are not entirely sure, but they think that those stripes are actually as a warning system um, trying to ward off predators um, because they do have that really incredible, um, the skunk spray. Um, they th scientists think that those white stripes are trying to warn other animals to stay away. So much like a poison dart frog is super bright um, to let other animals know that it's poisonous and that it should just be left alone. That's why they have those big white stripes as a warning system. And then that spray is one of the best defenses of, of any animal. Uh, so it can shoot up to 15 feet. Um, but really, skunks don't want to have to use this. So it is um, ex metabolically expensive for them to have to make this. So it's a lot of work for them and they have to use a lot of energy to be able to make this spray. So for the most part, if you don't corner them or harass them, they really don't want to spray you. And in, in fact, they'll do a little stomping dance before they spray to try to um, get you to go away before they spray. But if you don't listen, then they can spray. And it's basically like their own personal pepper spray. So it's going to burn, it's going to smell really bad, and the purpose of it is for predators. So it basically shuts down all of their senses. They can't smell, they can't see, and that's going to make them lose track of the skunk. And so the skunk has a chance to get away. One of the main predators of the skunk is actually the great horned owl. So for the most part, most um, animals are not willing to mess with the spray and not willing to take the risk. But the great horned owl uh, has something over their eyes called a nictating membrane. So it's a third eyelid, it's clear, that comes down over their eyes that protects them so the spray doesn't burn. And owls, like many birds, don't actually have a sense of smell. Uh, so they don't smell it, it doesn't burn their eyes, and so they are one of the main predators of a skunk. These are little tiny skunk tracks in the snow, so they are surprisingly smaller than you might think. They're, they're not a very big animal, but again, they have those five toes um, and uh, pretty significant claws as well, you're going to see. And we catch them on the trail camera all the time. Um, and I have actually seen two skunks at Oxbow. Um, ironically, both times it was during the day. Um, so although nocturnal animals tend to be nocturnal, they don't necessarily strictly stick to that. It depends on the time of year and what kind of food is available. Um, and I've often seen them rooting around in grasses like this looking for, looking for food. All right, so time for another poll. So can you find the skunk in this photo? It's uh, gonna be a pretty tough one.
All right, I'll give it about five more seconds. All right, so we are tied 38% with bottom right and bottom left. Um, and bottom left is the winner. So right here, this is the white stripe of the skunk. And then the black body is right here. And this is the face. Uh, so I love this photo because for the most part, you would think that a skunk doesn't really have very good camouflage. You know, they've got that big white obvious stripe. But in this photo, it's just perfect that the white stripe looks like it's part of the branches. And then the body just looks like um, it's, a, it's a shadow. So right here is the little skunk. Thanks everyone for playing along. All right. So the one animal I can always count on um, to show up is the, um, the bats at Oxbow After Dark. So these guys are, uh, their diet is entirely insects. So they are super awesome. Natural pest control is, uh, they can eat so many insects. Um, a big brown bat in one night can eat up to a thousand mosquitoes. So we really like bats because they control insect populations for us. Uh, and they always come out um, at Oxbow After Dark and they come over to the pond and they'll swoop down and eat um, the insects and also get a drink of water out of the pond and eat the insects that are flying around by the pond. So bats are the only mammal that are capable of true flight, uh, which is really super impressive. So uh, yes, there are flying squirrels, but they don't actually truly fly. So they can't lift themselves up any higher. They jump out of trees from, from high up and they glide more than anything, but they can't flap their wings and get up any higher in the air. Um, but bats can. And uh, they do this with some pretty impressive bone structure. So that's what is here on the very right hand side is the bones of a human compared to a bird compared to a bat. And what I think is really interesting is that the bats in um, the bones in a bat's wing are the exact same bones that are in our hand. So this is color coded. So this little thing right here is actually their thumb. And that is the exact same bones that are in our thumb and all the way down to the fingers. So the bones of our fingers is what makes up their bat wing. Compared to a bird, they have a completely different structure um, that allows them to be able to fly. Um, the most impressive thing that bats do is that they have that echolocation that allows them to be able to see in the dark by sending out uh, sound waves and waiting for them to bounce off of things around them. Uh, and so it's a really impressive trait that they have. There is a species of bat called the spotted bat, which is pictured here. And as you can see, the spotted bat has massive ears um, that allow to capture those, those, um, those sound waves. And these ears are so big that they're actually a detriment to the bat when they're not using them. So if they aren't using their ears, if they're not out flying and they're not out echolocating, they will actually fold their ears down flat against their head. And then when it's time to go fly and they need to go echolocate, they can pump blood back into them and make them stand up again so that they can use their ears. Um, because otherwise they can lose way too much heat and be burning way too much energy by losing all that heat through their ears. So they'll just flatten them down when they don't need them. This, um, the sunset photo is not actually at Oxbow, but it is in Reno. Uh, so this is the McCarran Bat Bridge. Uh, so during normal times, all throughout the summer, uh, we lead bat walks out at the McCarran Bridge. Um, and this is what them taking flight looks like. Uh, so these are thousands of species of Mexican free tail bats. Uh, so definitely, um, you can go check them out um, by yourself and go down to the McCarran Bridge um, over the Truckee River on East McCarran. And we have a couple of photos here. Um, I believe these are pallid bats. Uh, there are 23 different species of bats in Nevada. Um, and we actually don't know what species we have at Oxbow. Uh, they're super hard to identify when they're flying around. Um, so we don't know what kind of species we have, but we think they are probably a species that roost in trees. So the Mexican free tail bats here roost underneath that bridge, um, but there are lots of species of bats that also will hang out in trees during the day. We have um, quite the family of mule deer at Oxbow as well. So they are um, herbivores eating all kinds of grasses, leaves. Uh, they'll even eat sagebrush during the winter when uh, food is pretty scarce. 
Some of the adaptations that mule deer have is they have really excellent hearing, as you can see from those giant ears. That's actually how they got their name is uh, because they were named after mules, mules ears. <laughs> um, they have those really big ears, much like mules. So that's how they got their name of mule deer. The males will grow antlers, which they use uh, to compete with one another to try to gain the affection of a female. And antlers actually fall off every single year uh, in, in the fall after they have gone through what we call the rut, which is when they're mating. Uh, so after they have com competed with all of the other males, those antlers will fall off and they have to grow a brand new set. And they grow super, super fast. So it's uh, considered one of the fastest growing living tissues on earth. And when they're growing, they're covered in this fuzz that we call velvet. Um, and that is an, an actual blood supply that's being sent to those antlers. Um, so it's fuzzy and they can feel it. Um, and that is what's allowing them to grow really fast. And then after they have finished growing and they're as big as they're gonna get, they, uh, that blood supply gets cut off and it starts to feel really itchy, kind of like a scab. And the males will rub their antlers all over trees and bushes and rocks, whatever they can find to try to rub off um, the, the rest of the the rest of the velvet until it's just the remainder, the normal antler that we're used to seeing. And during um, the early summer, so usually around June, is when uh, deer will have their fawns and they are born uh, covered in spots um, and that is actually as a source of camouflage. So mother deer, so while baby deer um, fawns can actually walk within 30 minutes of being born, they still can't quite keep up with mom. So while mom goes out and forages and finds food, she will actually stash the baby hidden in um, the trees and branches um, for a couple hours sometimes. And those white spots are supposed to imitate like dappled light. If you can imagine light coming down through the trees and it's, there's the spots of light on the ground, that's what those spots um, on the fawn are supposed to represent um, so that they are, are camouflaged. So she'll leave them stashed in the bushes and fawns are born without a scent. So they are basically invisible to predators. So they are camouflaged, they don't have a scent, and they will just sit there and not move. So if you ever find a fawn um, that's hidden in the, in the bushes, it has probably not been abandoned. It is probably just waiting for mom to come back and hiding from predators. So we see the deer very regularly, but we also catch them on the trail cam quite a bit. Um, so we have uh, a pretty big family that lives out there. And in the bottom left, you can see their tracks. So they just have those two toes instead of the five toes that you would see with the, the skunks and the raccoons. And I have another poll, <laughs> another find the animal. So can you find the deer in this photo? All right, we'll give it about five more seconds. All right, I'm not as tricky as I think I am in this one, apparently. Um, so yes, 89% of you correctly found the deer. Uh, so it is right over here. So this is the neck and the nose over here and the ears, but it blends in super well with this tree in the background. So deer do have really good camouflage especially if they're out in the, in the sage and in the hills, they've got excellent camouflage. And our very last animal that we are going to highlight tonight, which I think is the most exciting, um, is the black bear. So black bears um, are omnivores. So they've got teeth that are very similar to humans. So they've got pretty flat teeth in the back with some um, big canines in the front. Um, they'll eat all sorts of grasses, nuts, berries, um, insects. So they have these huge claws uh, that are not necessarily weapons, they're not meant to be weapons, but they use them to rip open logs and they'll sit there and eat insects for hours, uh, including bees. So a lot of um, People think that, yes, they love honey. Thank you, Winnie the Pooh, for that. <laughs> but they will also eat the bees inside of the, the hive as well, in addition to the honey. 
And then they'll also eat carrion. So again, find other dead things. They are not very good hunters either. Uh, but they've got those big claws for ripping open things, digging out their hibernation dens, um, and also for climbing trees. So black bears, uh, anytime they get scared, uh, will just go up a tree. Uh, so they've got those big old claws to help them climb. The black bear's uh, superpower is really their sense of smell. So they have a massive nose uh, and they can smell over 2,000 times better than a human. Uh, so that is really what is their driving force. Um, it's what gets them into trouble, what leads them into uh, human areas following our delicious smells, um, and it, it's what leads them down to Oxbow. So uh, during the fall at Oxbow, we have a bunch of uh, fruit trees in the very back of the park and in the fall is when they get ripe. And in the fall is also when bears are going through something called hyperphagia. Hyper means a lot, phagia just means food. Um, and so this is when they're gearing up for hibernation. Uh, so their whole purpose in life during this time of year is to just is eat as much as they possibly can and put on a bunch of weight before they go into hibernation. And so during this time, they are truly driven by their nose and they will hunt um, or forage for like 22 hours a day. Basically the whole entire day, they'll be looking for food. Um, and so this time of year, it leads them all the way down to Oxbow so they can follow the river, not hardly come into contact with anyone and end up in Oxbow and they'll come into the back end and eat out of the fruit trees in the back in the fall. Um, they often leave their calling cards. So that was the first time that we ever knew that we had bears in, in the park was we found a big pile of scat and some perfect tracks in the sand. Uh, it was super exciting. And I guess the scouts get to see all the cool stuff because there was a, a Boy Scouts group <laughs> there that day that got to see the tracks and the scat. Um, so of course we immediately set up trail cameras and over the last few years have found all kinds of animals, um, but especially the bears coming through the park. So you can see this one on the top right, pretty big bear um, that was spotted a couple of times. And then in the bottom left, those are actually some cubs. So there was an adult with two cubs uh, that was there as well. So there is all kinds of good snacks at Oxbow during the fall. So how can you go see nocturnal animals? So nocturnal animals are literally everywhere. So they can be found right in our own backyards sometimes, but definitely in neighborhood parks, um, anywhere down by waterways. You can find them at the Truckee River, Carson River. Um, they are all over the place. The best thing to do is just go to an area and be patient. You got to look, wait, and listen. Um, and just be patient and wait for them to arrive. And while you're out looking, always keep an eye out for evidence of wildlife. So keep an eye out for tracks that they might have left behind or their scat. Or if you're looking for beavers, you can look for beaver chews and sign that they've been, been in an area. So keep an eye out for evidence of wildlife um, so that even if you don't see the animals, you know that they were there. So sites that are similar to Oxbow across the state, um, if any of you are not in the Reno area. So um, in Southern Nevada, there is the Clark County Wetlands Park, um, which I have sadly never been to, but I've heard marvelous things about it. Uh, in Eastern Nevada, as far as I know, there isn't any wetlands parks, um, but there is the Ruby Lake National Wildlife Refuge, uh, which is beautiful and has all kinds of amazing animals out there. And here in the Reno area, um, coming soon, the Trekkie Meadows Parks Foundation is opening uh, a nature study area as well in uh, Southeast Reno in the old Rosewood Lakes Golf Course. Uh, so there is going to be the Trekkie Meadows Nature Study Area there coming soon. Um, and this photo is of a muskrat uh, that Amanda took at Oxbow uh, recently. And uh, so again, just gotta be patient and wait for them and you can find all kinds of critters. Thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And at this time, we would like to remind you to please stay home for Nevada. Um, and again, thank you so much for coming. My contact information is at the bottom of the screen. If you think of anything later and you have any questions, um, please, please do email me. Um, Scout and Amanda, do we have any other questions that need to be addressed? Someone asked what type of bear goes through oxbow? It is a black bear. So um, great question. Black bears are the only kinds of bears that we have in Nevada. 
Um, so no, no grizzly bears can be found in Nevada. So the majority of them are going to be brown in color, but they are the black bear species. All right, as of right now, we don't have any questions, but we have a whole bunch of thank yous. Oh, awesome. Good. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, we hope to maybe see you again next week for our birding webinar. Um, but Endow is doing all kinds of webinars um, all the time. So definitely go to our Facebook page um, and check them out. And at the end of this, uh, you will be redirected to a survey. So please fill it out and let us know if there's any other webinars you'd like to, to see or what you thought of the program tonight. So thank you so much for coming. And I'll hang out for a few more minutes if any other questions come rolling in. Um, Alyssa has a question. What is your favorite animal? Oh, good question. I think probably I have to put them in groups. So my favorite animal to teach people about is the bear because they're just so much fun and they have so many cool adaptations. But for the cuteness factor, my favorite animal is the raccoon. Uh, they've just got that the little mask and the hands. They're, they're just adorable. So I'd have to say a raccoon. <laughs> All right, then if there are no other questions, then I think we are gonna go ahead and wrap it up. But if you do think of anything, please email me and let me know. Thank you so much everyone for joining us.